This is the Anfield rap. They're all talking. They're all talking about things that are irrelevant to football, ladies and gentlemen, because they've got lives and thoughts separate to the match. As Liverpool beat Stoke by two goals to one, I've got no idea how the managers have thoughts that are irrelevant to the match. Uh, Paul Cope, John Gibbons, Annie and Salmon with you for the next hour or so. And the reason why, John, is it's... Uh, it's the sort of result you you uh, we we did a we did a lot of pretty much stuff actually together me and you last week and you yeah I was actually intrigued for someone who's really quite mild mannered about the football mild mannered the wrong word someone who's quite balanced about the football you wouldn't shut up about how big a game it was and you actually had me on pins yeah. uh, <laughs> by the end of all this like I was like I thought it was a big game but John's saying it's this big a game yeah but imagine how much you enjoyed it because of that well, I, just, I was psyching you up well exactly and that was what I was about to say that's why you end up on rooftop gardens <laughs> it's, John it's probably only got bigger in the manner of the victory to be honest with you uh, because of because you know it it felt like everything by half time it just felt like absolutely everything was going wrong you can't put into it's hard to put into context exactly how big a three points that is yeah if they'd have it, to put in context of, of how big a three points it is, you've got to think about, well, what, what if we'd have lost? And if we'd have lost, it would have been all the insecurities, all the negativities, and all the all the genuine issues around this football team kind of coming to us, really. Problems with the squad, issues around kind of decision-making around around the team, defensive frailties, the fact that you can't go somewhere like Stoke, who've, you know, on form, one of the worst teams in the league at the moment, and you can't go there and win. You know, I, I didn't realise we hadn't won a away game in 2017. Imagine how highly strong it would have been if I'd have known that. <laughs> so, so it would have been all, all the kind of, all the problems coming to roost. And, um, you know, there's hours at the game and people were saying half time, we well, can forget about top four now. And there's other people saying, well, they don't even look like they, they, they wanted, they bothered about top four type thing. And, and so to come away with, with that win, it just, it feels like anything's, well, not quite anything's possible now, but you feel like you can believe that we can go on a run between now and the, the end of the season where I think it did a lot that, you know, you're looking at West Brom the, the next week and thinking, well, did, you know, they're not going to get anything from it. And you're looking at sort of other games after that and thinking, well, are there enough games, you know, winnable games for this Liverpool side to, to get enough points to get it? But now you feel like, you know, that the Liverpool can go unbeaten for the rest of the season. Ian, it's all that. I completely agree with him that John's just said there. But also, the other thing is also the Bournemouth disappointment. It's yeah. the, 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 the way in which the Bournemouth game finished. They felt the fact that it felt like a backward step. There was also the pressure of everyone else's fixtures. I mean, we were recording this before Arsenal had played Palace. But you you do wonder whether or not it's a weekend where no one misses out or where one side misses out. And I was thinking, I remember thinking at half time, we're going to be the one side this weekend. We're going to be the ones that slip up. Everyone else is going to be all right. Whereas now there's a ton of pressure on Arsenal tonight against Crystal Palace. I think we've, we've really ramped that up on them. All of this just turned that second half performance into one that really could end up being the turning point of the season. Oh, oh completely. After I mean, after Everton, the Bournemouth, the idea that we could take apart Everton in the manner that we did, a team that's actually been playing really well, and we could dismantle them and show that they had absolutely nothing they could challenge us with. For us then to turn up against Bournemouth and shoot ourselves in the foot for the millionth time, I was saying the morning after the Bournemouth game, I feel like we've not been defending that goal since the Sunes era, <laughs> at, the, at the very, very least, possibly longer. But it's the same goal we've been not dealing with for absolute decades. doesn't matter who the manager is. doesn't matter who the players are. doesn't matter which fans are behind them. We have never been able to, to defend that goal. So we do it to ourselves against Bournemouth. And then we basically do it to ourselves again at Stoke. And we look like, this, this is a script. We are just shooting ourselves in the foot. We're proving what everyone says. And then you get that second half. And it is, it's... I wasn't hyping it before. I was just kind of like, I'm not even thinking about Stoke. I don't want to think about West Brom at all. But this is the kind of second half that shows the narratives don't matter because if you can inject quality from the bench, you can change a game. And we changed the game quite brilliantly. Lots of things we got wrong in the first half, but that's the other narrative. The narrative the Klopp doesn't learn from his mistakes and the Klopp will make mistakes. Well, Klopp looked at and went we changed this and we changed it brilliantly and it, it does feel it feels this very moment like once again we can do anything we want we're on that moment where Klopp's yelling at the linesman no one can beat us although obviously everything went very badly after the last time we had that moment but th this feels right now this feels like we turned um, it felt to me very looking back on it and more more so sort of when I was thinking back on it well, I well, rewatched the game watched the highlights uh, Paul Cope it, it was all very very Benitez sort of back end of a season 
this is my path through this game. I mean, Benitez, but you know, very. We're going to get to sixty at nil nil, and then I'm going to then I'm going to change it, and we're going to win the game. You know, there's there's a ton of these that there's been historically the biggest, the the, the most clear one is oh eight oh nine Portsmouth when he picks a mad shape, he picks a mad team. That was in January, even late like, end of January, because everyone's legs are falling off then. And he does all that, and we win 3-2, and there's loads of people moaning after the game, after we won 3-2 <laughs> yeah. with the last-minute winner. And went Ra- top of the league. And went top of the league, rather than going, we won, we got the, we got the win, we found we found the route. But it does, it very much remind more than more than any manager since Rafa, and more than Klopp has so far, seem like Benitez. It did all seem very, very Benitez. These are my boys to get me at nil nil to 60, and then I'm going to bring the class on. Yeah, it's a, it's ironic, really, because I, I, one of my uncles came to the Bournemouth game with me, and we were having a, we were having a Klopp versus Benitez conversation on the way out which I which I had to cut short because I told him we only had 20 minutes and I, I didn't have time to get into I didn't have time to get into his Benitez's defensive and rubbish argument but the point I was making was because he said do you not love watching this type of footy and I said yeah I, I like watching us win mainly and I, I, I could do with us winning the league in a bit really quickly and uh, Joe, just get back to winning generally trophies and stuff and he was his point was basically well I'd just rather watch this type of footy and I said, I, well, I just, I disagree. I, I just, I, obviously, if you can have the dream of, and Chelsea have been searching for this for years, haven't they? You have the dream of amazing footy and you win all the time. Well, we'll all obviously take that, but there's very few footy fans have ever had that over the years. And and the thing that Rafa had, which which we we sort of touched on, but we've we've talked about at length in, in these rooms in the past, is the ability to just to win a game. And when you've got, you know, great players talking about tactics and, and him being a great, tactician and being able to win any game and you think back to the squads he had yeah it was it was it was actually it was interesting that Klopp then had that game immediately after me having that conversation which is a very long and rambling way of me saying that but it was I, I don't know I when I saw the team I was I saw I saw I actually saw a Ben Jono tweet after the match that he'd sent before where he was saying I'm oh, made up with that team but I, I when I saw it I wasn't thinking oh well this is this is Benitez and, and we're gonna we'll get through this. I, especially after five or ten minutes when you're watching it thinking it's just all really disjointed. Yeah. It it wasn't and I think that's where the sort of clash between a Klopp and a Benitez is, is that they looked like a load of lads to me who had been thrown together in a system yeah. and yeah. no one really had a clue what they were doing. Whereas with a Benitez type manager or a Mourinho type manager, you always seem to get that impression that when they switch, when they change their shape, when they do something a bit mad, the players are still going. Yeah, we we know what we know what we have to do in yeah. this sort of shape. I didn't mind the team too much. I was I was surprised. I was a bit well, but I was like, oh well, let's see how how we'll go here. Yeah. I think the problem was he just he tried to change too much. So it was an unfamiliar formation with a few kids thrown in and people were just being asked to do kind of things that they're not used to. Like one of the worst performers first half I thought was Nathaniel Klein yeah. and so normally you think well he's someone you can rely on in the madness but he's, you're asking him to play left wing back I don't think he's he looked like he'd never played there before and he was just sort of the problem with moving someone from the right side to the left side in that system is if you do it in a 4-4-2 do you think oh I'll just play it safe and I'll just sort of I can play me left back and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll try and win me battle and I'll, and I'll kind of pass it inside but for you to then say, well, you know, you need to do it as a wing back. It's 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 kind of like, well, you know, we're going to put you on the wrong side and we want you to attack more. And he was he was just kind of flustered around the whole thing. And and you know, you're throwing James Milner in midfield for the, I think the first time this season, certainly for a start. And I don't think Wijnaldum was quite sure what 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 he was being asked to do either. So the the, the problem was was wasn't just the kind of changes. It was just so many that even the lads you think you know you mentioned those teams you know. You know, you you can make free changes or whatever. And you can bring kind of free kids in or whatever if if you've got the people you can hold your hat on. And there was almost no one. You know, that's the, that's before we even get into the back three and, and kind of how confused they seem to be. And so everyone everyone's head just seemed a bit kettled really. And there was no one apart from maybe Emery Chan going. Do you know what lads? It's all right. I'll I'll we'll I'll get you through this. You know, we we'll play well and then you can just do something on top. And that's why I felt really sorry for the young lads because, you know, I mean. To throw Ben Woodburn in and ask him to to knit a midfield and attack that's a midfield which doesn't seem to know what they're doing and an attack that's Divock and Reed. He's just dead hard, yeah. dead hard for to ask a young kid to do. I think um when I saw the when I saw the players, I was shocked by how he he picked their positions. Because yeah. something we've talked about in the past is he's actually he's he's actually sort of gone away from his mean on this. What he usually does is he moves as few people as he can out of the position they usually play. So so he'll go, he'll start and go work backwards. But 
the way he picked those players. Felt like he moved everyone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it, and, and I didn't think it was necessary because when I looked at it, I thought, and I, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of of Trent being played in a in a more attacking position, and I thought, well, you could keep Nathaniel Klein right wing back. You I thought keep, you were going to put him front three. Yeah. Keep well, we, put, we lumped him on first goal. We were like, this is going to be great. Yeah. The bookies don't know what we know. And, <laughs> but, but, but this is, if you'd have had, if you'd have had Milner left wing back, Klein right wing back, and Trent and Woodburn playing closer to each other behind yeah. the Rigi, that seems to me like naturally it makes a bit more sense. Because on your point, you've still got Klein and Milner yeah. then in positions that yeah. they're pretty much used to playing yeah. in. And you've got the three experienced centre halves. So it all feels a bit better. I think just by the fact that you moved Klein across, throw Milner in the middle. It, it just felt very disjointed very quickly. There was a uh, on the shape then, uh, Ian. It's fair to say that it starts off on the shape is, is is terrible. Terrible will do. Woeful can be applied if you'd like. It's can we go with shape plus? We can. It, can we can go shape. Well, the thing about it was it actually reminded me a little bit. You mentioned Everton before. It reminded me a little bit of the worst of what you'd seen from Everton when they came to Anfield uh, before they had the flurries and all that sort of stuff, where every single Liverpool player seemed to be five consistently five yards away from where you thought he needed to be. They were all starting from the wrong starting position, then not quite getting there, coming off second best quite consistently, no intensity yeah. because they couldn't get any intensity up because every single time you tried to do something, you were in the wrong place. I mean, it, you know, you can. I think. I think you can. It becomes one which as with everything in football, you end up sort of towards the manager, pointing the finger at the manager. But there is also a, it might be that the players themselves just hadn't understood it. It might be that the players themselves just didn't employ it well. My point is, there were huge, huge big holes in that first 10, 15 minutes and Liverpool were, were just a mile away. Absolutely massive. And I think you've got to look and go, realistically, when was the choice made to play this system? And it's, it's, it's got to be Thursday. It's got to be post Bournemouth. Why has it got to be post Bournemouth, Ian? Because he actually plays at Jordan Bournemouth. Does he play at Jordan Bournemouth? I didn't well, he goes see to three at the, the back, Bournemouth doesn't he? He went to the three at the back. He goes to the three at the back and wing backs. Yeah, with Matip, he goes for so for the last half hour. He's played the yeah. three at the back, hasn't he? So has the choice been made? Pre Bournemouth, is, is he, he having a look at Jordan Bournemouth? Is what I'm always asking you. I'm not, I don't know. Is he having a look at Jordan Bournemouth? But surely the it, point is still they haven't got a huge amount of time to work on. No, not no. at all. Even, even if if you say this post Bournemouth, he's got a day to work on it. If it's pre Bournemouth, then there might be three days to work on it. But there's not a great deal of time anyway. And there didn't seem to be a cohesion between the idea of what formation we're playing. Because one, one of Klopp's big things, and the points I've, I've loved going back to all season, is this idea that he says you only see our formation when we're defending and the rest of the game should be flexible. And with this, when we're defending, you couldn't see what our formation was. <laughs> it, it might have been a 5-3-2. It might have been a 3-5-2. It might have been a kind of hybrid 4-4-2 with Klein pushing far, further forward than Arnold was doing. But you, you couldn't tell. There was no way to actually... You look at the shape and you look at the shape specifically when we uh, concede the goal and everybody's too far, too far up the pitch. You don't know where people are challenging. There's a moment where, there's moments in the second half, the, the moment where the cross comes and the Mignolet makes a magnificent save from. That happens because Lovren is making a challenge somewhere near the halfway line as the right-sided. And we always say that he doesn't play well on the right side of his central defence anyway. So we've now decided that Matip, who is better as a right-sided central defender, is going to play in the centre with Lovren to the right of him so we become very left footed but then the left doesn't seem to work and there's there's clearly there's been no time to work on it and it, it feels like it feels like one of those moments where Jürgen trusts the lad so much that he's going yeah it'll be sound this so it's okay lads don't worry this is all going to be great and as you said it seems like everybody's in the wrong position it feels like we've got a two up front but then it feels like Origi's peeling off to the left on a day when you would expect him to actually be far more central it, the whole thing felt like it hadn't quite gelled at any point whether the gelling had been in the thought of what we were going to do and whether it was the last half out of the Bournemouth we'll have a look at this because this is what Stoke are going to do so this and we all believe that West Brom were going to see the three at the back again but it felt like something needed a good couple of weeks to work on I just I, on the centre half order it, it doesn't really make sense to me to have your best balls playing centre half in the middle like it felt like the amount of times I was watching Clavin and Lovren like striding up the pitch and going what if that was Joel Matip this would look yeah. a lot better yeah. and Matip's just watching them going bloody hell this is rough isn't it <laughs> <laughs> and it just it just kind of seemed a bit mad to me I mean it, I think the temptation is always to put the tallest lad in the middle isn't they? but you know yeah, Lovren's proved how good he is in the air and, and I don't think they were really playing with, with, with 
with those sort of with that sort of front line. So yeah, it, I I don't get it. Do you think he John just had asked the question really as you you moved it? Do you think he's maybe trying to protect Matthews back? But there could be an injuries, element so to that. Still, yeah, you know, because... if I put him, if I put him on the sides, Walters plays on Walters plays there. This way, you can stroll through the game. We can have all the the, the apparent, but he, he should he should always be the one who's sweeping rather yeah. than having to having to having to yeah, climb up. Yeah, there could be an Big element John. to that. They could be thinking, well, you know, they're they're going to have to be a bit more mobile. But neither of them are sort of brilliantly mobile anyway. And this is what annoys me about. I feel like you get kind of vogue formations to come in and, and, and Chelsea. Since Chelsea started winning a three in the back, I think everyone's had to go with it, haven't they? Like everyone in I the think we're the last league. side now, basically. Yeah, basically everyone's uh, oh, had to go Mourinho. with it because Chelsea are winning at it. And it's not like it's not the formation that's winning games. They've just found a formula that that works that suits their players and it, it suits you know the centre halves. It suits the likes of Victor Moses. Who you wouldn't pick as a full back, mm. but you know as a wing back, it kind of it really suits him. And I think you know that's what. I know. I don't understand about football managers. Is that they'll go well? Well, that's working for Chelsea. Look at them flying. Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll have a bit of a go without seemingly any any kind of context in terms of well, have we got the players that are suited to play that formation? Because it seems to me, kind of ev- evidently, we don't. I mean, if you're going to play, if you're going to play three four three or whatever it ends up being, then we'll give Albi Moreno a go. Then do you know what I mean? If you if you're going to say. You know, rather than rather than trying to trying to shuffle things in and trying to play climb there, you know, if you're gonna, if you're going to do that, then at least try and find the players about who maybe it suits rather than this idea of pick the formation first and then kind of throw in whoever you know you fancy to do it. I think I think we have to give them the benefit of the doubt that they, this must have been worked on previously. I can't imagine we haven't had pre season in, in which at some point they've said, look, we might need to do this at some point, lads, so we'll just give it a go. And Because he, he did talk about pre- before the season started, yeah, yeah. he might change the formation around as he, as he went along. But I, I I agree with the lads. that I think that this comes back to this, the, the old point about formations versus players. And if you watch, I remember when we when Chelsea came to Anfield, watching David Luiz play in the middle of a back three, and, and you all automatically go, well, he's the weak point, you can get at him. And I was saying to the lads sitting by me, he, he plays that position almost like having a free role from centre-back. Yeah. So he's got two centre-halves next to him who are basically playing like two normal centre-backs. And then he's just free to go and press everybody. So playing against a lad like Firmino, it's, he's perfect for that. Yeah. Because then that lad who usually finds himself in acres of space doesn't get anything because La- Luis is so front foot and pr- pressing, knowing he's got these two reliable defenders next to him. But if we play three at the back with the players we've got, you can't possibly do that. It's a completely different style of play it's a, it's actually a completely different formation and then when you go back to what Ian's saying about Joe is it three is it five is it two in the middle is it is it just two up front which which is what it looked like and I, th- I actually thought that was the maddest thing of the whole setup was the Origi and Woodburn thing at the other end because you saw so many times how the two of them just didn't give you any outlet really the, n- the number of times you saw Woodburn and it was I think it was one of those games for Woodburn you sort of look at it and go you can see he's got ability but it it doesn't do anything for me who hasn't seen that much of him to go. But why is he, why is he, for example, better than Harry Wilson? Why is he better in that position than Trent? Who, Joe, there were a couple of times where Woodburn gets the ball and you think there's a break on here, and he just hasn't got the legs for it, and he never and he never will have. Will he? He's just not that type of player. So there's, I think there's loads of there's so, loads of stuff to question in in that formation. So what, 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 what question? Then so why do you think he did it? Um, I think. If, if you if you allow he's looking at it against Bournemouth, let's allow that, but yeah. may not be true. But he's looking at it that it's not just a tactic because I think one of the things it does is it makes the change that he actually makes on sixty five against Bournemouth now make a bit more sense. If he's been thinking to himself, I'm going to do this against Stoke, maybe going to do it against West Brom. That, you know that makes a bit more sense. So why do you think? What, 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 what do you think the thought process is? I I would say it's it's literally it's it's as simple as we've we've been a bit vulnerable. With with whatever combination we've we've played, we don't still have our first choice team. If Matip's a little bit injured, I'd rather have three lads in there at the back against the team like Stoke. I'd just rather have three of them there. We can double up. There's we, they've going to have the aerial threat. We the thing is about Stoke, you know exactly what they're going to do. Things change over the years, but going to Stoke is is a, is pretty constant. And I I think. It'd be interesting to hear what Sean's got to say about this, actually. But I think there must come a point as a manager where I was criticising them after Bournemouth that this must be coaching. This must be coaching. You know, when we, when we concede from a set piece and they're just not reacting to a second ball, my immediate reaction to that is it must be the coaches because how can how are these lads repeatedly not reacting to a second ball? But if you're Jurgen Klopp and you're sitting there going, it's not the coaching. 
the coaching spot on. I've been doing this for ages and I've got I've had defenders in the past who react well to this. Then what's your next move? Your next move is to say, change the players, but we've had every combination of players you can have in the back line, especially. So then to say, okay, we'll go with all three. So do you think he just wants big lads? Do you think it's that's he's, he's thought set pieces have been vulnerable? We know what they're going to do. I think I've got to gamble on what West Brom are going to do. At the time when he makes the change against Bournemouth, Afobi's still on the pitch. I don't know if he finishes the game, but he might be thinking to himself, I'll have a look at this now. I'll go with three big lads in there, plus MA Chan. Klein's all right. He's not huge, but he's all you know, he's all right in the air. Milner's five. If he's almost just thinking, maybe it's just not enough big lads. I think so, yeah. Okay, and, and, and I think his, his previous teams have, have traditionally been quite big. And I think if you look at a defence and you think we're struggling on second balls, what's easier to fix? Just win the first header or get everybody to be better on second balls? And I would look at that and, and think instinctively, we'll just win the first header. Because the first headers that we're losing a lot of the time, like the Jaggy Elka one, you shouldn't you shouldn't really be losing a, a header to Jaggy Elka in, a, in the box. He's not he's not huge. He, th- that shouldn't be happening. So he might have just looked at that and thought, well, if I have more of those lads on there, the chances of just winning the first one, and that removes all of the risk of the second one. What do you think? Are you in first? Ian, then John. Um, well, I think there's there's an interesting dichotomy going on um, because I think partially the team for the weekend is built on the fact that. These are the lads who are fit enough to play, to, to obviously to a very great extent, because we're, we're missing five first choices mm. out of that lineup, and you know we know that Coutinho and Firmino aren't in a position to play the full ninety minutes, and we and we know the reasons why. I think possibly you look at it and go, well, we're playing three at the back because I've got three central defenders who are fit enough to play. Now the dichotomy is a great deal of our season has been based on the fact that we we do basically play three at the back a great deal of time. Although we're nominally, again going back to this idea that you only see our shape when we're defending, we're nominally a 4-3-3. A great deal of our play is three at the back, but the centre at the back is the deepest line midfielder. It's the number six role who's dropping between the two central defenders, mm. allowing the full-backs to push up. So we are playing a great deal three at the back, which is why I think this felt more like five at the back than three at the back. I think I think it was there as a case of the players I've got are defensive enough to sit here. Now, the question then becomes, okay, well, why at that point do you say, okay, Milner, we'll shove Klein over to push Milner up to a position he's not played in when we've actually introduced Trent Alexander-Arnold on the right a couple of times recently and we know we can do it. Um, I think it's it's been very much... I think it's forced on through the injuries and through fitness concerns and through the fact that you're looking and go, well, we've had now, after not having a game for a month, basically, we've now got three games in the space of a week. And these lads aren't fit enough to do three games in the space of a week at the moment. That The legs are going on a few of these. And if you look at the second ball, if you look at the Jaggy Elka header, that goal happens because Chan loses his man twice in that move. First, he loses Jaggy Elka, then he loses Pennington. And... Is that the point where you go, okay, well, a third centre back there is going to be better at Trachis Chinder's man than the lad that wants me number six? And is Chan better employed to actually push the game forward than he is to be in the box doing that at that point? So I think it's been a combination of injuries, fitness, and absolute necessity. But once again, we've still been def- defending that goal badly for the best part of 25 years and possibly always will. Although, again, the second half, we defend that move a lot better on two separate occasions. We do actually challenge the second ball a lot better. Uh, but I, I think it's being complete circumstance and necessity to set it up that way. I, I don't really know why, what his thinking was. Um, I think the high thing, there's possibly something in it. I think he's you know he's looked at to maybe the away games coming up and thinking I could just do with more big lads on the pitch and, and until I can... You know, maybe get Jordan back in or whatever. Then, then this is my option. I think there's maybe something in that. I just don't see how that team was going to score a goal. Um, in terms of how they set up and how they were looking, I, I just didn't see how a, how a goal happened. Yeah, we might have, you know, got a penalty or whatever, but that that's not a game plan, is it? You know what I mean? That's not, you know, a, a kind of style of play thing. And it just didn't look to me like. And maybe he thought, well, I can if I if I can get to sixty and, and bring my lads on, and I think that'd be enough. But I just think that's always that's always a bit of a dangerous game, really, with young players and with with a team that's a little bit fragile. You know, it's not a team that's that's looked like a nil nil at sixty all season, certainly not away from home. And so, I think I think that was just a risk. That was a risky strategy. 
And, you know, a, a, a manager can be lucky as well as praised, you know, and I think there's elements of both in in this performance. You know, we can say, oh, you know, it shows this and it shows that. But I think we've also got away with one quite massively, really. And mm. I think I think Jürgen has in terms of, you know, how he, t- he set the team up. On that, John, on the idea of getting away with one, I think that a couple of things end up going in our favour. Uh, I think, firstly, Stoke will be... It comes, if you're Mark Hughes looking back over the game, you're thinking, we should have put them to the sword early. Should have had them more to go first half, yeah, yeah, definitely. Had a real opportunity. And the other thing that undermines them massively is Alan goes off. I think when Alan goes off, I think that's a real boost to us. You could see he was working it out. He was he was getting on the ball. He was pinging it about quite happily. And 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 Charlie Adam comes on and, and, and he doesn't have a very good game at all, ends up getting hooked himself. It's to me, I thought that, that we, when you're talking about sort of getting away with one and it's happened to us this season, you know, sometimes you we've had games this season where we haven't got what we've deserved by the end of the game in a in a positive to negative sense, if you know what I mean. Games we might have deserved all three points, we haven't got them. If you are Stoke, you are sort of coming out of that game at the end and yes, Liverpool finished strongly and we'll come on to talk about that, but you are thinking we should have just got out of sight there first half. Yeah, that's what they'll be thinking. And I think they'll, they'll probably think they could have pushed themselves harder. I mean, I think sometimes it's it's harder for, for the team who's, who's low in confidence a little bit. And, you know, they're playing against Liverpool and they're playing against a big team. So just realise, instead of 15, 20 minutes in, I go, we've got much the better of it here. We should be kind of pushing on, pushing on, because you've always got the mindset of, A, how you're playing in your own form, which has been very poor for Stoke but also in terms of we're well, playing against Liverpool and you play against the shirts as much and the reputation as much as the kind of what's in front of you really so I think there was an element of that I think they treated Liverpool with maybe a little bit too much respect in terms of what kind of what they were getting back but you know they might they might look at the two big chances the other Miguel saves and I'm sure we'll come on to the Miguel saves are absolutely brilliant but I would say Eight times out of ten for both of them. If you hit them that hard on target, they go in from where they did, and that's what they'll be thinking. You know, I'll I'll, I'll praise the saves because they're absolutely brilliant, and he gives himself every chance. Make a lay on both of them and and comes up. But you know, you're Charlie Adam. You're thinking, well, you know, I, I hit that hard and low, and and they nearly always go in. You know, better he you now gets a great connection on that in terms of you know the cross and things and gets it on target. And I think they'll they'll both be feeling unlucky. In terms of what you know, well, what more could have done? Type thing. We'll come, on, we'll come on to that because I think they actually, I think, I think the second one, the better he, you know, one actually leads to Stoke just having twenty minutes where they might as well not bother because <laughs> I've just took it, uh, which is interesting as well when you talk about the side with that confidence. But do you think with us, Paul? Again, is you know all three sentiments we mentioned at the nowhere to be seen, maybe Emre chance to a certain extent, but all three of them, if it is five three two, the three of them aren't offering much. The movement, uh, terrible, and confidence and belief sort of through the floor as the game's wearing on there in that first half of Liverpool. And again, it shows shows a number of things. I think it's, an, it's a hangover from the Bournemouth results. It's the fact that things aren't going very well. And then it goes on to show that the manager's had a hell of a half-time. Yeah, it, I, it was really weird watching it out because I'd, I'd been the races Thursday and Friday and, and that first half was one of those games that you watch when you're hungover and you're like, I, I just can't be bothered with this. It's, it's awful. And you t- I know we, we talk about Joe Allen leaving the pitch, but... I couldn't believe how much of that first half was literally played at walking pace by both sides. There were times when literally we had like Emre Chan on the ball and he was just standing still in the middle of the pitch with the ball at his feet and he'd just look around. And then and, and I think in, uh, it's sort of in defence of, of our lads to a certain degree. If you've gone out in that team away at Stoke and you're thinking, well, we know what the plan is here. The plan is get to 60 and then our big boys come on and win us the game. Well, if you're sta- if you're able to stand in the middle of Stoke's pitch with the ball at your feet and no one's coming near you, I'd take that. If I'm Emery Chan, I'd just stand there, and because because what's he going to do to force it from there? It's it was a really bizarre game. I saw um, Tony Barrett tweet it. So it was like a it was like an end end of season yeah. um, game or like a testimonial. Was it was it really hot? Were you there? It was warm, yeah. So it it, 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 lo- it looked like it had that look of it of mm. everyone's a bit tired and it's a bit warm to be yeah. sprinting. Third game in a today. week, yeah. But it's funny you say about the bench as well because I, I think even if it's not the plan, and I doubt I doubt Jürgen's going in and saying, right, lads, we're getting to 16. I doubt he's actually saying that. But even if it's not, it must be on the back of the minds yeah. of the players. Yeah. Like, you know, you say an Emery Chan, he's thinking, we just need to get through this and then them boss lads are going to come on. And Even if you're a Rigi, he's yeah. backing himself in the minute. Yeah, the, one, yeah. the one thing you're thinking is, I'm running channels here to soften them up because he's going to bring these lads on. Yeah, yeah. Or, or I'm going to get the cavalry and then we're going to play together and, and, that, and that's going to be the time when I come alive. And I think there was a, a general lack of trust in each other first half as well that kind of contributed to, to the poor performance from Liverpool. I thought 
it w- couldn't stick on Will Ben. I actually thought Will Ben grew into the half and he has that decent run where he wins a couple of tackles. And But I thought he grew into it, but first 20, it just wouldn't stick with him. And I had a look at how many passes he, he completed in the game and I think it was 10 or 11 and in the first half. And it, it felt like lower than that to me. I was surprised it was that high because it's, it's, it felt to me like every time he got the ball, he lost it. And I think that was partly because he didn't have any options and it was partly because he was just getting kind of bullied off it. But you saw it, a reluctance to, to go in and join him to give him options or to go and join him from the likes of Ronaldo and Shan. And maybe, you know, you say, oh, you just got to keep doing it anyway. But I think it's it's natural. If you're a midfielder who's a bit worried about your defence and what Ben gets the ball, are you going to run forward 10 yards and give him an option? Or you've just seen him lose it twice and they were hanging back and hanging back. So it kind of, it became, it was a problem that became even worse by the fact that his, his teammates just weren't helping him out. But they weren't helping him out because they were thinking, well, I'm going to run up to the pitch and he's going to lose it. And so... That became that became a kind of a, a real issue for us, kind of as a, as a football team in terms of th- there wasn't so much trust. Where as soon as Coutinho and Firmino came on, they were like, "Well, I can run forward and I'll get the ball." And that's just that's just an attitude change that comes from having a better footballer there and having a footballer there. That, and also there's understanding and things like that. They think, "Well, if I make that run, I know he's fine with me." Whereas I don't know about this Ben Woodburn. And so there's a there's a bit of kind of understanding as well. But I think it's also I think they had a little look and thought we need to play a bit safe here, and they were far too safe. And that's where I felt a bit sorry for Trent because you've seen his delivery but he looks up and he's just got the Vakarigi there not really moving and you know it was it was it was, it was very tough for him yeah you, you see that moment um, very early on where Woodburn makes that run where he never quite digs it out of his feet yeah. and all of a sudden he's got five stoke shirts around him but Arigi stays to the left he doesn't pull in he doesn't pull in for any possibility yeah. of getting a loose ball he, he stays for a wide ball which is never ever going to be on there, yeah. there's no way that ball is yeah. coming out to you on that wing from that position that Ever so the sensible run is to go inside. But talking on the subject of the bench, wouldn't you think that the the team talk beforehand would be see these two lads here? They're smart, but they're absolutely fucking buggered. Yeah, I don't want to play them, so we're not going to try and get to sixty, and then I'm going to bring the cavalry on. I'd like these to have a day off if it's all possible, lads. Please go out and win the game without them. And here's, here's Daniel. These three are just here to scare the shit out of Stoke, and that's all they're here for, in the hope that we don't actually need them. So in terms of we'll try and keep it tight and then bring these on to win the game for us, it, you would think that's a, the last thing that they'd be thinking. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not. I don't know. I'm not convinced about that because it when you put that team out on the pitch away at Stoke, I think it's maybe different if you're playing at home. But I don't think I don't think Trent and like Ben Woodburn are looking at each other going, "Well, we'll we'll just win this. Yeah, we'll just beat Stoke away. That's what we'll do." Especially when, like, I, John said this earlier. Like, if you drop those two lads into the team so that's been fire, flying right? lately, and you go right, we're just going to win. They go great, okay, yeah, I'll just do my thing. But when Ben Woodburn's getting the ball into his feet and he's looking up, and there's no one within twenty yards of him because James Milner's forgotten how to play centre mid because he hasn't played there for ages, and when Aldum's doing a bit of a, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, meant to be doing here today, boss. And Arigi's stuck on the just, wings. <laughs> like that, I was just screaming at the telly. Yeah, that, 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 that one like, when he runs through, he wins the two tackles and he's running. And it, I, I would love to sit down with Origi in the video and go, what was going through your head? I Why can't. weren't you making a mad, di- not even a, just a diagonal at full pelt and screaming at him saying, just put me in. This is this is my thing about Origi. And I, I think, I, yeah, I know he, he sort of proved me a little bit wrong last couple of games because he'd look, he's looked good again. But I've just got that concern with him that it's just not all there. And... That, that for me is just your typical, like one of us playing footy, watching a lad who's doing something boss. He's going, right that's good, that. <laughs> <laughs> but the worst, thing, well, the worst thing about it is that Woodbury loses it and then he get up to, gets up and apologises to me yeah. just because he's a kid and he's nice and yeah. he's just like, well, I'm a bit new, so I better, yeah. I better say sorry for losing that. Whereas he should have been like, <laughs> where do you mean? Any hopes? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. couldn't, honestly, I, I would love to go. Go on, just tell me just what you were thinking. You're a centre forward for the, you know, you are a centre forward. You should actually be screaming at that lad to say, yeah. "You're 17 and you're not that fast." I'm a centre forward. I'm the senior player. Pass me the ball. I so think I can he's give got, got ball. himself into space, and then because he's still in space, he's thought, "Well, I've still got loads of space over there." <laughs> 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 you know, the fact that no one's, no one's asked about that if, <laughs> any, any of the pitch anymore because there's a kid running right through the middle. But I think he's like, "I'm in acres here. What's going on?" <laughs> the only thing, big that- switch. <laughs> 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 the only thing that might make sense. Actually, as I was saying, Joe, his, his special move, do they feel special move with it? Joe, yeah, you, yeah. you do the uh, L and right buttons, left yeah. and right buttons, and all that, and he puts it in the top corner. Yeah. Origi's is from the left hand side of the yeah. box, isn't it? Where he so steps just thinking. So he's thinking, just give it to me here. Yeah. I don't need to get into the into the pen spot. I start here, I carry it 20 here. yards, and then I'll just put <laughs> I'll a far put corner, corner for you. Yeah. yeah. 
you wait and see. Uh, <laughs> play to my strength, you. Uh, oh, it's so frustrating. This is the second half, then they can see the stupidly soft goal, Liverpool. And it is such a soft goal. Everybody basically stinks. It's like, I feel like Lovren's been taught somewhere where you stay on your six yard and there's your edgy six yard book from across. <laughs> so he's like, got to his point and went, well, I'll stand here. Yeah. Oh, what's the matter? Well, not my fault. Someone told me once in training three years ago, yeah, when they cross on there, get gay. So we got in a great position for the. A completely different thing, and then, and then what? Well, I've stood here. Like, yeah, you know. I, when so, I watched the so, highlights back, there was there's this there's this split second where Shakiri's gone past Clavin, and Lovren is stood between Walters and whoever the fella is. It's better, you know, I think. And he just sort of he sort of glances at better, you know, and stops as if to say, "Which ones do you go for?" And it's too late. Like it's like, well, go just go and defend the front post, and then we'll worry about better, you know, afterwards. Someone else needs to be covering you there, mate. Someone on Twitter was defending the Lovren by saying that he was anticipating the rebound. No, I thought that, yeah, <laughs> I thought that, that was that was as optimistic as things get. I, don't I, know think, he, was, I think he is split. I think he does he have is. split. But but, but, but there is a there is a clear answer, which is the lad who's three yards away from the goal. Yeah, yeah, him. If you, sort if, yeah, <laughs> but if he doesn't get it, that's probably ideal. Yeah. And then if the lad behind him gets it, then maybe someone just has to charge at him. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but, but also, Matip doesn't come out of this with any glory because the ball goes in. Well, he actually moves his body backwards away from the ball. So as the cross goes in, so I've watched it three or four times this morning, obviously Klein gets skinned by Shakiri. No, I'd then, say Clavin. Was it Clavin? Just no, Cla- Klein gets done Klein's first. Oh, okay, so then, I apologise. Yeah. There's Klein, another lad to slaughter. Klein gets done first, <laughs> then Clavin misses it completely. And then as um, as Shakiri put kills the ball in, Matip kind of half jumps, but th- this is this makes for lousy radio. Um, he, he kind of he shifts his body. Yeah, you can do it by me moving away from Mike. <laughs> uh, he shifts his body backwards. So he kind of bends backwards at the waist, away from the ball. So it's kind of like he's not putting himself in front of it. He's got the chance to, but he moves his body away from the care of the ball. It's the weirdest movement. And then obviously, Lovren's just wandering around looking I, at other footballers. Uh, do you when you talk about like coaches and like people getting slaughtered and stuff, and, and Klopp is always the one, isn't he saying, if if the players make a mistake, it's my fault, and if if I do, if if we win, yeah. it's them. If we lose, it's me. He must watch that and go, that is not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> These are, they're all shit. Like, let's sell them all. Because every, it, literally every single one, you go through, like when you said then Klein, you're like, was it Klein? Like, you can insert any player's name into the start of that. Yeah. They were all rubbish. And it only took one of them to do the right thing and we wouldn't have conceded the goal. It would only have took one of them through that was that was my great fury as well. Yeah. If one of you is all right here, we're probably going to get away with it. Yeah. Uh, but then we don't get away with it. And if anything, you know, in the end, I mean, again, John can say, and I agree with him really that there's, there's tons of fortune in Liverpool getting the result, John. But it may well be if it be nil nil at half time, he might have thought I can hang on here, I can get another fifteen out of these. As it is, whether or not he's already decided, he has a big half time. He gets them in, and that's when he changes it. And Coutinho and he keeps the back three, but Coutinho and Firmino just making an immediate difference, linking it up. Yeah, definitely, and I think. You know, although you shouldn't be praised for bringing on your best two players because, you know, it's, it's it's quite an obvious move. I think it is still quite brave to put them both on a half time, knowing what you know in terms of the fitness and in terms of, especially with Phil, you know, knowing that, you know, you might get 20 out of him and then he might just completely go. I think I think it is brave to do them both. I think the, the change in formation works in that it's very much a front three rather than this mad asking Ben Will Burn to be Kenny Dagalish. I think... Um, I think it's 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 a nice move, and yeah, everyone comes alive, and it's and they're just they're just at it from the get go. You know, it's not it's not amazing football, but it's much much better, and it just shows kind of how low the bar is. But you know, it doesn't take much to to, to look better than these teams, is what I'm getting at. You know what I mean? And and this is what's frustrating me this season is that we've made it much harder than it actually is to be better than the likes of Stoke away from home. And you look at you know, the, the likes of the whole game and things like that where, you know, and, and barely straight off and you think, you know, you just, it's it's not as hard as you're making it look, boys, you know what I mean? You don't need to, you know, you've, you, you're just making bad decisions or you're not kind of committing to the, the football that, that you should be playing. They really did commit to, to, to a style of football. They were zipping all over the place. I so thought some of Firmino's movement was was excellent, you know, forgetting about his strike. And yeah, they just, they just, Everyone just kept saying it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, and the, the atmosphere in our away and second half was absolutely brilliant. Considering you know, it's you think it's an hour gone and we're one 0 down at Stoke and we haven't won an away game all season, even though I didn't know that then. <laughs> no, all, all 2017. Sorry, see the atmosphere then. You know, in terms of what you're getting from the fans, I thought was brilliant and. 
you know, the, the, the players, you know, we, we, you know, we, we kind of buzzing off each other, if you like. And so you just felt to me, I mean, I was Wayne Scholes next to me and he kept saying, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming like that. You know what I mean? Whereas, I mean, I've been with Wayne when it's not been coming and he's, it's, it, that's not his mindset. Uh, it's, well, well, that's the thing. I was, <laughs> I was about to say that, that one of the big things I liked from it, Paul, again, something that we've not seen a lot of, and maybe, maybe you do have to, it has to, does have to be sort of a bit undeserved. Maybe you do have to be a bit lucky, but simultaneously, I, we turn the screw and we haven't done a lot of that this season. Not not least because we've often just just been so good that the, the screw doesn't does the screw just turns. If you know what I mean, you're not turning the screw. You're not going through the activity of it being hard, it being strenuous. Mm-hmm. But there it was. It was hard and strenuous. But they turned the screw. You could see that Stoke themselves were all looking at each other like we could do with this finishing pretty soon here. Yeah, it was. I just on the, on the double substitution itself. I I think the game being so rubbish helps Klopp to make that decision because it goes back to something Damien Hughes was talking about a few weeks ago about the attitude of the players in your squad and your philosophy and all the rest of it. You can, I can imagine Coutinho and Firmino sitting next to each other on the bench looking at all that space and all the gaps between all their lines and the time that Emery Chan's got on the ball and going to each other, when we go on, we're going to both score and we're going to do this and you do that. And that makes it so much easier because, I mean, even for fans, the amount of times when you're in a good position on the side of the pitch and you can see all kinds on the pitch... And that comes back to the whole attitude of, well, if you're a player sitting on the bench analysing all of that, you know that when you go on, you can have an impact quicker than the lads who are just daydreaming and, and thinking, oh, I'll just go on and do my usual thing. And I think we saw, we saw all of that because the reality was there was loads of space first half. So for the for Coutinho and Firmino, they're, they're always going to be able to exploit it. When As soon as I saw them coming on, I thought, we'll, we'll probably win this now. But it, but the Stoke's big thing was, it, it did remind me of this sub I always talk about when Beckham and Keane came on for United and the, the, the opposition, like, oh, Christ. But th- the big thing for them was they they should have known, and maybe they, they didn't know this, we only need to get through half an hour because these two will both burn themselves out because they're both absolutely knackered. And, they, they, well, I suppose it goes back to your point as well about they, they were probably well, a bit unlucky, weren't they? No, because they, the- did, they, they didn't get, we didn't put them out of sight in that little spell. We only went one ahead. On the turn of the screw thing, though, I think the other thing that happens is that I, f- I felt momentum was actually beginning to dissipate around sort of 60, 62, 65. And then he introduced a strategy and he didn't yeah. stand on ceremony on that. He wasn't thinking to himself, oh, I've only got one more change. I best I best keep it back. Just at the moment when you thought Stoke have managed, before we get onto the miss, the Adam miss, uh, Stoke, Stoke had managed to regain a degree of equilibrium, I felt. And then you bring Sturridge on and you can see whether we think so or not, whether or not, because we've seen so much Daniel Sturridge, you could see from his first ball, which is the through ball for Firmino, and the goal comes from it, so that obviously helps. But you saw the Stoke players almost have an element of, oh, no. Yeah, and it is it is the storage that we want to see. And I think, that, you know, great to that point, you can have those days where you do press, you do turn the screw, and all you get is the equaliser at best, and then you can see the 2-1, and, and the game runs away from you again. I think we had, from the moment we made the substitution, we suddenly had a shape that we didn't have in the first half, because all of a sudden we are very definitely three at the back. There's no messing around with are these two lads' full-backs. No, these two lads are playing as wingers now. And Phil's kind of sitting in the pocket behind two men, so he can orchestrate things. So... Once you've got that dominance, even though it begins to eradicate, the fact that you can make that that change and you see the intelligence of storage. And now, obviously, it's been a terrible season for storage. And to be honest, I didn't expect him to see, a red, see him wear a red shirt at any point again this season. I thought that was it. I thought we were done. Whatever had happened, um, whatever injury picked up, we weren't going to see him again. To see his natural ability to drop deep and start to win the ball back and to make things happen from deep, which he's done brilliantly across the years he's been with us. To see that, that first ball, that that ball he plays, if that was Paul Pogba, Sky would have that on a loop for the rest of time because that ball is incredible. That's a fantastic, intelligent pass. That's the kind of thing that, that makes a difference to a player of that level than your your average player, you know, with all the will in the world, that Origi is probably never going to play that ball for us. Daniel Sturridge just has that bit more in his locker in terms of his thoughts about the game. So for, to be able to bring him on, that's the moment where we actually change the game again because we've got that level of intelligence for, for the whole front three at that point. Yeah, that, there's not much much more to add to that. Um, it's it's funny with Sturridge because I've sort of I'd sort of given up on him completely mm-hmm. as well. So it's it's like a little added bonus that he comes on and he does that. And I think I think your point is right. I think. Most Liverpool fans have probably given up on him now, and we just we're just sort of counting down the days from leaving. But to the rest of the country, Daniel Sturridge is still Daniel Sturridge. They they don't. It's it's like the it's the reverse of if we talk about Mignolet later. It's the reverse of that, isn't it? They when we watch our players every day and we analyze every little thing they do and we criticize every little thing they do, 
which includes all of the stuff that's gone on with Sturridge. The rest of the country don't see that. They just see him banging a goal on or match he, of the day or that pass. Or, or even if you, if a team sheet comes in and your manager can say, yeah, but you know what, he's nowhere near fit enough. His legs have gone, he's finding it out at the minute, blah, blah, blah. But when he actually is introduced into the action on 67 minutes and you're playing football and you haven't got a guy to go, don't worry about this, just, just do this to him. I've, I've watched some videos, blah, blah. All that's going through your head is he's really good. And these two have also come on and they're great. Yeah. And now we've got all this to think about. And I, I just, it's it, it does change mindsets, John. And also, what's also in the red, I think, is that the ad, at that point, the ad and misses happened, and we will talk about that in I a second. Think, I think his teammates have got a lot more faith in him as well than, than the fans have. And I think you're talking about mindsets. I find it interesting to watch Liverpool sometimes when we need a goal and the, the team are defending deep. And I find it interesting who, who they pass into. And what we'll get a lot is Coutinho and Firmino. They'll just pass to each other. We'll look, wait, Firmino go, where's Coutinho? Coutinho go, where's Firmino? They'll look for Mane. Um, and then, if it's not going well, they'll maybe they'll maybe put it out to you know to mill on the left or something as, like a, that. as a last resort almost. He, well, well, he, he's 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 above the last resort because the last resort is kind of the other fellas. There's almost a, 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 a kind of the the, the pass, they'll pass in order of, of who they want to pass to rather than where people are and where people are positioned, and that's always. I've found that interesting watching them because you think well you, you're limiting yourselves here, and I understand why they do it. Because you know they, they, they think, well, who's who, who's got us out of this in the past and things like that. And they, 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 they'll ignore one or two players. And they were starting to sort of swerve at Eiji, I thought, at that point, because it, it wasn't happening for him. You know, I thought, I feel sorry for him first half, but even second half when we were playing a little bit better, we, you know, a couple of times where he gets an opportunity to put a good cross on and, and just kind of hits the man really, really lazily. And lazy is not the right way, but you know what I mean? It's not even, it's not even zipped into him. Um, you know, he's not, he's not allowed to do a lot to block it. And I think they were just sort of giving up on him. And so, but storage they'll get him on the ball. And I think that's that's quite an interesting thing to to, to view. So it's almost another attacking player. It, it, you know, that's I know you mean, yeah, yeah. It's another fella they feel like, well, I can get him and he, and he's gonna do something good with it. And so it's a it's another one the best players trust. And I think I think that was the main contribution that, that Sturridge made, you know. And I'm I'm really impressed with him for the first goal as well, not just because of the the pass that the you know, the uh, the pass that Ian's just talked about, but also how quickly he's on that lad's shoulder. And so he plays the pass through to Firmino. Um, it is, isn't it? Yeah. And then the move breaks down, and then it goes to Henry Chan, and, and suddenly he's on the shoulder, and he's, he'd have had to move a fair pace to get there. And my criticism, one of my criticisms of Sturridge in the past has been that he does drop too too deeper, then just stay there. And you know, he's he's kind of admiring his nice twenty yard pass or whatever, or he's just thinking, well, I'll just stand back here for a bit more and think, you know, all right, maybe drop a bit, but then you've got to be. And, then, and he is, he's straight on the shoulder, and he must have he must have moved some to kind of get there really. And and the goal comes. Partly because that's what they've got to defend, you know. But with Sturridge there, he's got to defend it, and then and then it drops to Coutinho, and, and and that was kind of an impressive thing to me. So, I think you can see how you can see how Sturridge contributes now between now and the end of the season. I don't think it's as a starter necessarily, although we might not have any any choice if if people can't stop dropping. But in terms of you know if if, if it's one all against West Brom on seventy, then what a great option, and they and they you know it's a good option for his teammates, but. But it was funny because as soon as we went 2-1, he was sort of useless. And I thought that was... You'd almost, you'd almost have made, be able to put an argument to bring, bring Origi back on. Oh, massively, yeah, because there was because he's... And, and I don't think... I don't agree with the lazy shout. I just don't think he's able to get himself around. And so and so when, once Liverpool drop and you, you just... He's not able to press quite effectively. And he's trying. He's just... He's almost got it, you know, like... A, you know, when you, when you go running, you have to give yourself a bit of a, a jump up in the air to get going. He's almost got to do that now, you know. And there was one where he, he sort of ran the channel, but you could tell he didn't really want to. And then he got the ball and, and he got out, outpaced by Shawcross. And Shawcross just kind of moves him out the way. And you're like, oh, mate. It's just like horrible to watch. But he is having a go, you know. So I'm not going to criticise him. But it was almost like a half an hour of... of Look, you can see how that Daniel Sturridge used to be a player, but but how why he's not necessarily going to start him against West Brom. I'm sure there'll be people who want to see him start against West Brom, and I understand that because watching really good football is his boss. But you know that that last ten minutes, it was it was sort of playing with ten, and and it was it was quite kind of hard to watch really for someone who um, who really likes Danny and enjoyed the little cameo. If you if you know you're going to be on top, you want him on the pitch. Yeah, if exactly. you're not going to be on top, yeah. you're thinking he's not going to help us get on top. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, the yeah. problem with him at the minute. You, you don't see how we, you don't see the journey towards storage getting you on top in the game. On the goalkeeper, then, uh, would you a goal from a corner? By the way, but I'm just saying that in general. So, I want to talk before we talk about the goal, the, the, the two saves, Paul and the winner. I want to talk about the mad header from Ronaldo, and we can laugh <laughs> about it now. 
in that, you know, you can laugh about it because you win the game, and you can almost laugh about the one on Wednesday, the mad back pass, and it's 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 almost frustrating to me it's the same player twice because now it sounds like you're having a conversation about the player, and I'm sort of not. I'm just sick. We've got to start cutting this mad shit out. It's got to stop because you can't keep doing this to yourselves across the board. Really, you, you can't handball with a goal in the early part of the game. You know, the, to me, this doesn't seem. And I, I, in a sense, I'm almost glad it's Wijnaldum because if it's Chan, we're back having a chat about Chan. Whereas we all think Wijnaldum's broadly speaking great, loves the club, works hard, seems switched on, seems like he's got a brain, and now he does this. And I'm twice two games back to back. So it's, there's positives and negatives to it being two games back to back. My point is though, collectively. Just stop making it easy. Stop giving them easy chances, lads. Genuinely, just stop it. Yeah, I, I'd be intrigued to chat to, to a top manager about how you go about doing that. Like, what is it? What what what's the cause? What what leads this? I when I wrote that article last week about being brave, and then it, and it was funny actually that that the Wijnaldum thing happened just after it, and I was sort of saying to people that that's the point I was making. <laughs> My uncle, who I referenced before, thought I I was just I just meant being brave is shooting from the halfway line. And I was like, <laughs> no, that no, that's not it. It's 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 more yeah. the Guardiola thing of passing out from the back, and even when fifty thousand people are on your back, keep passing. And the reality is, if you want to play and you want to teach your players to play like that, the the Wijnaldum one against Bournemouth is gonna happen. I I don't I actually don't think that's something that you'll you'll necessarily yeah, cut I out. Agree. But I think that the Stoke one is almost more worrying for me because it looked to me like that wasn't a I'm trying to get the ball back to just panic, Middle United. It? it looked like he was panicking, and it also looked like he was worried about Walters running into him. So instead of just going. Well, I'll just go and sort this out. He was sort of like half hanging his head, thinking I'm going to get clattered here, and that that worried me a little bit more. I, it, it is funny, isn't it? Like it, it's funny that you mentioned it's it's Wijnaldum, and I, I often reference this that you, your analysis of players is based on your own perception of them and and the the lens through which you look at them. Chan would have got absolutely slaughtered for that. Is is the reality? Lucas would have got absolutely slaughtered yeah. for that. Um, I think I think it was really poor, I, but I think the reality is. I don't know. I don't know how you solve it. I don't. Th- I don't know how you solve that one. The the other one, I actually think we do. We just have to accept one or two a season. You you can. That's going to happen. It, it happened when we had Stephen Gerrard playing for us, and he was passing to Thierry Henry once every other season. Um, the winner, Ian, is. I mean, first that save from Adam John's discussed yeah. it before, where he stands so big, it couldn't make it harder for them under the circumstances that there's about four of them uh, all around him. You know, I th- maybe that sort of makes his decision a bit easier. And what's the point of going to ground? They're all stood next to each other, lads. Um, but he, he, he's he, but he's got four to it's, think about. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant. It could save. be anything. It's, it's 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 a brilliant save. It's it goes beyond that point that's been made so often. Simon Mignolet is. He's a great shot stopper. It's beyond being a great shot stopper. It, it, it's excellent goalkeeping. It's you wouldn't think that's in his locker, and it is the it's the ball that we wouldn't have defended in the middle of the week. So we actually do defend that ball. You know, obviously it's the goal he defended, but we defend it brilliantly. He does fantastic for both his crucial saves in the match. He's gained us three points with those two those two saves because on another day, Stoke do they win three one. And they win 3-1 quite easily and we're talking about a completely different thing. It changes the season, as we said before, in a very, very bad way. But he does, he stands his ground and notably both the saves are made with his feet. There is, we'll come on to the second one in a minute. Before then, though, there's the winner, uh, Paul, which is just an incredible goal. It's the, 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 the sheer confidence of it, really, because he's got tons and tons and tons and tons of options. One of which includes controlling it, uh, and he chooses not to do that because he just knows where it is. He's so he's so relaxed and certain, and it it's just a gorgeous strike. Yeah, it's <coughs> it's one of them, isn't it? Like that that the view that someone's got from behind, where when Alden you see the pass and then you see the end erupt, is phenomenal. And I I absolutely love Firmino's you know, his, his celebration. I love the fact that. He's been booked more than anyone else in Europe for exuberant celebrations. I think that's that's the type of lad you want in your team. You should just carry on doing that forever. I'm not asked. I, like, how, how, how quickly can he get his shirt off, by the way? I think it's amazing. You should see I'm, me trying to get undressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think Doing his state, I would sit down halfway through. He's like, he's on the to, to be fair, though, I think if we had bodies like him, we'd get really good at it. Like, oh, I, yeah, I, I mean, I've got a lot getting in the way. The time. <laughs> I've been running through town doing it. Look how quick I can do this. But but the the I, really I, impressive thing, when the share falls, oh, it falls flat. Oh, yeah. isn't it? It's, yeah. it's, it's gorgeous. I think he's done that. But I, think, I think actually as well, one of the funny things about that, it, it reminded me a little bit of Gerard in Cardiff, where, it, where everyone's like, oh my God, that was brilliant. And afterwards, he was like, yeah, I was just knackered, to be honest. And when he, he's got like three Stoke f- fellas bearing down on him, 
And he's probably thinking at that point, split second, I'm best just hitting this. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just hit it. Yeah. <laughs> That's it's phenomenal. Great it's, goal. it's a great goal, John. Yeah, it's an absolute belter. It's just, it, yeah, it just, the, the timing as well is just a real killer blow two minutes before. I think, you know, it must kind of demoralise them, really, really demoralise the crowd. I was really surprised, actually, how, how, how much the crowd gave up after that. And I think, you know, you, you say they're in bad form and whatever, but... You know, you look at the arguments that Klopp's had with our ground for, for staying and things like that, and you think, it's oh, it's, it's a Liverpool problem. I'd, I'd say on 90 minutes when that fourth thing went up, I, I would be surprised if that ground was a third full. And it's and it's mad when you think about Stoke and the reputation they've got against the home fans and things like that. You know, I was like, there's no one here. There's no one left. I was like, we're going to get a great, we're going to get away. Brilliant here. because every, it's <laughs> Because everyone's gone. And I was like, you know, it's just... And you think, I'm not going to go with Stoke fans necessarily because, you know, you've got to walk a mile in the shoes and all that. But, you know, I was I was shocked to, to, to think, you know, look around and think, well, surely they think they can get someone out of this because, you know, have you seen us defend? But, you know, they they just kind of given up really. And I think a big part of that was the, was the second goal and, and how he hits in. And I think I think the manner of goals I, sometimes can deflate fans as much as as much as the goal I, itself. I think the timing, but also the fact that they must have looked at it and feel, well, he's well better than anyone we've got. I think, I, I come back to you on that, John. I think you actually look, we go we, we go to, we, we, we go 1-1 one, one, uh, through Coutinho. We've done the storage introduction. Firmino does that. You're right, and it's like it would that 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 it reminds me. Well, it's not actually dissimilar to the Vardy one last season against when we yeah. went to Leicester. And I I remember I've always said that's the most demoralised I've been by a goal in about ten years yeah. because I'm just looking at it going, but we're not going to score now, and he's just done that, and that yeah. feels like cheating. That feels like it shouldn't be, <laughs> should, just shouldn't be allowed that that, that they've yeah. got someone who can do that, whereas we've been messing about for ages and not and going nowhere. Yeah. There's that, but I think the next thing, John, is then the save from Berahino. Yeah. The save from Berahino happens. So all these these three thing, things happen in six, six, seven minutes. And if you do support Stoke, we've all been football supporters. We've all sat there and we've all had this moment with our head in our hands going, you know what, we might as well just get off here. What's the point? Yeah, because it's almost the, 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 the thing about the saves. Well, look, it's a brilliant save, but quite often they'll just go in anyway. Like if it hits the yeah. keeper, like the fact that the, the trajectory it takes, it's a bit like the Dudek one in the, in the final in that the trajectory it takes after it hits him is actually a bit mad. Yeah. Like, why does it go over there? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And so, so they must be kind of thinking, what, you know, you, you're half celebrating those, aren't you? And, you know, better, you know, a, a decent striker. And so I think there was an element to that, but that really helped us because it, it allowed us after the, the better Hina managed to actually see out the game all right. And I think that's something that they'll benefit from as well. You're looking at things to move forward from, from this game and, and things that will hopefully help. And I think the fact that, at least for the last sort of five six minutes, the, the, you know, it was it was relatively instant free. I think I'll, I think will help them in terms of you know just belief moving forward. The other thing I, I thought as well when you refer to last fifteen in this in is I think that Klein, Channel and Aldum end the game really strongly. And I mean by that by, by in terms of the touch, in terms of the quality, but also physically, I thought the three of them ended the game looking like looking comfortable, like the fittest lads on the pitch. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think that that was one of the things that helped Liverpool see it out was they were up against this Stoke side. They could have come under some sort of pressure, but you never really felt like they had a physical you, they had no physical move against the Reds by that point. You could just see all of those lads were stronger than their alter, than their opposite numbers. Yeah, and and I think notably Chan has been he's been very noticeable for that last few games because he is showing a great deal more of himself lately he's becoming that much more physical player and seems to be embracing the responsibility as as Henderson did when he was playing alongside Gerrard without Gerrard Henderson embraced responsibility I think Chan's doing the same thing can I just go back to the goal for a second as of well of course um, I honest to God didn't know that Firmino had that in his locker I've seen him score plenty of good goals I love him I think he's a really good footballer I didn't think he had that in his locker it's the first Suarez-esque moment we've had since Suarez left and it was one that you would expect Suarez hit that ball and you would celebrate because it's a world-class goal. And it was it was still a world-class goal. And yet, that obviously demoralises Stoke. But we do, as you said, we do end up, we're winning the physical battles all over the field. All of a sudden, we look like a team. And we've always said that we, we would pride ourselves on being fitter than everybody else. But we're beginning to look at, as the season goes along, we're beginning to look like in those last few minutes, we can hold out. We're learning. We're definitely learning. And that, as John says, one of the positives to take from it, the fact that we closed that game out at that point. Um, we close it out. We see that we do the business. We could do with a couple more of these between now and the end of the campaign, Paul. What I mean by that is Stoke are in a bit of a funny place. They were demoralised. We took advantage of it. We were a bit lucky, like John says. They get to say it's not really been our day. We get to say we don't care whose day it is. We've got the three points. It's, you know, you're looking at the table now, you're looking at the games Liverpool have got left, six to go. 
you think three wins will probably be enough for definitely will. It's Liverpool could just do with again just getting the nose ahead in games, demoralising sides, knocking the stuffing out of them, and being able to say, "Yep, yeah, we don't care about deserving anything at this point. We're just, we're just we're just adding the points. We've done all the work to deserve things early in the season." Yeah, it, Mourinho said something funny yesterday, and this this sort of touches on um, that some of the teams we'll play and some of the teams that are knocking around the Premier League now. And he described he described Sunderland as when when you're playing a sad football team. Like a sad ground, and I thought that I thought that was really poignant because it's because I think that's that's the point you were saying about Stoke. Like mm. they they're all just dead sad, so like they're not they've got nothing to get excited about really. And whenever you're playing teams that are sort of at this stage of the season, either in the relegation battle and they're a bit demoralised, or sometimes better, just nothing really to do, nothing nothing to play for, don't really care. What yeah. what does it matter? And and that's where with half an hour left. They're, they're the point. It's like when you, if you're training yourself or you're in a run or whatever and you're like, when you're knackered, that's when it takes that extra bit of effort to go, well, I'll close him down here instead of just standing still. When you're a fan in the ground with half an hour left, if you're losing 2-1, their keeper's just made a couple of good saves. That's when actually you you should be picking yourself to go, no, we'll we'll do this. And that we see that even at Anfield. with mm. you know In a big game, everyone will do that. Come on, we've just gone behind, but we'll keep supporting them. But when you're just playing... It's the sixth, sixth and last game of the season. You West Brom, how bothered are you? And I, and I think that is it's really important then for us to to be dominant and to be aggressive early on because you can then start blowing teams away. I think and and you'll get to half time even where they just think we're not we're not interested in this. It's a chance for us. I mentioned the Palace game before, John. We could do with obviously them dropping points this evening. They'd be very very helpful. Also, it was interesting post match to go through the top four stuff. Guardiola said. Uh, on his match of the day interview, he said uh, he thinks it'll go to the last game. You know, he's he's saying City are now very much in this with us, which for the last few weeks I've been getting a bit annoyed actually with the way in which it's been talked about that it's United, Arsenal, or Liverpool for the remaining top four spots. I've been thinking, hang on, we, we're, we're ahead of these lads. <laughs> um, we're literally ahead of them if you rank the teams and the number of points. Currently, we've got more. Yes, they've got the game in hand, but the game in hand against Man United. It, it's the stage of the season where you know everything just goes game to game. West Brom will probably want to stick one on Liverpool that's something that you come up against at this point mm. but I agree with Paul in that if you can get on top of them you can you can do something and also that you can get a bit of rest in these lads now as well yeah I think the week off will be really really good for the players certainly for you know the likes of Firmino Coutinho who were kind of on the lazies really and um, you know you might even get one back I mean wouldn't that be brilliant to, to hear here middle of the week oh you know with Jordan's in contention or something like that I think that'd be great but a bit of time to work on it if he, if he does want to stay a three at the back it gives him more time to kind of work and I think they'll they'll enjoy the training this week. I think you know the, the sun's still shining in Liverpool, and I think they'll 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 be enjoying each other's company because they've had a hard fought win. And you see it on the on the the Twitter and things like that. You know they they, they enjoyed it at the weekend, and you see the reactions after the game. You know it was a it was it was a big clap with the fans and things like that. So I think I think this week between the games will help. I think they'll go to West Brom with confidence, and and it's a sort of West Brom with more and more having. Less to play for, really. As you say, they want to put on one on a big team. I'm sure, you know, they really enjoyed that win at Arsenal, and they got a decent record. But that, I think that Southampton loss maybe takes the wind out the sails a little bit, and maybe gets them kind of drifting towards a little bit to, towards kind of no man's land in the league. And so, I'm, I'm I'm confident going there. And I think as 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 Kopi says about about the attitude, if you go there and in the face and stuff, and I think they could, I think they could play really well. Yeah, I think it's. Um... It's a similar game. I think the fact that we've just done Stoke, Stoke and West Brom on the bounce is a good way to have those two fixtures yeah, because you can, you know exactly what you're facing. You know that you're going to go there. You're going to face a very similar tactic. You know that it's going to be a battle and you know that you've just battled. And as John said, yeah, they're going to train this week with a bit of a spring in their step because they pulled that one out of the bag. You, you know, you've got to take that as a this, this is a momentum builder. If if you don't mentally, if you don't take that as a momentum builder. You've missed out completely, and they know that they've done something decent there, and they can repeat it. Okay, a huge thank you to Ian, Sam, Paul, Cope, and John Gibbons. The the season rattles on for the Reds. Uh, still so much to play for right the way through. If you want to join us on the Anfield Wrap uh, with all of the premium shows, uh, the Wrap dot com forward slash subscribe to listen to. <clears throat> An extra 10 or shows, shows and all the stuff that we've done in the past, the interviews and all that, you can get that there. That's the Anfieldrap.com forward slash subscribe. It would help if I could talk whilst I was trying to sell the product. <laughs> uh, but we take the strengths and weaknesses and we uh, we move from there. Uh, very quickly, you man the match, actually. Um, Paul Cope. Uh, Simon Mignolet. I'm, I'm, I'm I want to do another show this week where we have an in-depth discussion about 
how bemused I am by people still thinking after that game we should sell Simon Mignolet to buy some mythical, perfect goalkeeper that doesn't exist. Okay, John, give it us. Yeah, it's Mignolet, but just a shout for Emery Chan, who I thought was the only decent player first half and played well second as well. And Ian? Can't argue with Mignolet. One of the, the points there. Uh, thanks for everyone. That's the Anfield wrap. <laughs>